Numbers chapter 20, uh, Numbers chapter 22, I believe it is, and we're going to uh, look at an issue today that uh, actually I could tell when I put it on Facebook just a short time that I don't have my mic, guys. I don't. Is it up here? Okay, thank you. Uh, an issue today that affects a affects a lot of people. I think. It, I mean, I, I don't think. Human being, especially a saved person, and it's not affecting this. The issue is this: uh, Does God speak to individual people? And if He does, how does He do it? Does God speak to individual people? And this is going to be our Sunday school class this morning. And if He does, how does He do it? So we'll be looking at today, and I want you to start thinking about this. I want you about decisions that you have to make, decisions that you are making. Um, Directions in life, um, all kinds of questions that we come up with every day and along the trail of life. And how do I know the will of God? And I think this is important because Satan, this is an area where there will be a lot of satanic activity. Satan will come at you in this area because he does not want you to know, much less do the will of God. So if he can confuse you about what God's telling you or directing you, he's, he's going to mess your life up. So we're going to be looking at, uh, let's see here, uh, I want to go to um, yeah, Numbers 22. If you'll get there, we're going to just get a board up here and address some issues. And um, look at some various things and the ways that uh, people may say that God s speaks to them. Okay, let's ask God to help us today and speak to us through his word. Father, we come before you today, and we thank you, Lord, for church. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the word of God, that we have something that will be there when heaven and earth has passed away, the word of life. God, we thank you that it is the very word of God. And Lord, I pray today that you'd help us to love it, to delight in it, Lord. And I just want to tell you, Lord, I do. I mean, Lord, I honestly do. Lord, it is the delight of my life. For Lord, without it, <clears throat> I'd be in hell. My family wrecked. My life wrecked. My life spent in vanity and emptiness. But Lord, you gave us your word. And I appreciate it so much, Lord. Everything that we know is right and good, it comes from it. Help us to rightly divide it. And help us, Lord, to apply it to our hearts. For Jesus' sake and Jesus' glory through our lives, in his name I pray, amen. All righty. Uh, it's going to just be a little while till we really get into Numbers chapter 22 there, but uh, just kind of hold on to that. Let's talk in a general sense this. How can you truly discern and know for sure whether it's God talking to you or whether it's just your thoughts or whether it's Satan speaking to you? There's really three things that we want to look at. Uh, we need direction. How many would at least acknowledge that? We need some direction and we need some discernment. We need some leading. And so we're making decisions in life and we're saying, okay, is this God telling me to do this? Is this the devil trying to get me to do this? Or is this just my thoughts? How many's ever been there? Amen. How many's ever tried to figure out, hey, uh, you know, wh wh what is the truth here? What's, what is the truth? A lot of questions in life that we could bring up. But um, if God speaks to us individually, then how does he do it? What manner does he do it? Does God speak to a person audibly? Uh, does a person throw out fleeces? Does a person go by their feelings, uh, go by visions and, and dreams? Uh, does a person go by circumstance? Well, this happens, so that means that I should do this. So how do we decide those things? Let me just say first of all to you this. That the number one way that God's ever going to speak to you is through Scripture. Amen. All right. God is going to speak with, to you through Scripture. The old song, how firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. Watch this. Watch what the writer said. What more can he, what more can he say than to you he has said? Than to you who to Jesus for refuge have fled. You know what the songwriter is saying? What do you want? What, what do you, are you after God to tell you more than he's already told you? Have you already searched the scriptures? Or have you really searched the scriptures to find God's will? And why are you wanting God to speak something beyond the scriptures to you? What more can he say? 
How many would be like me and say, Reggie, I don't know much about the Bible <laughs> as it is. I need to know more. It's, it's, my problem is I don't know the word well enough. Amen. And uh, then our second problem is that we find out that maybe the Bible doesn't agree with what we wanted to do anyway. So we have a tendency to pull away from the scripture. But God's going to speak to you, first of all, through his scripture. Now, let me just say this to you. If you reject scripture, you are going to open yourself up to deception. The heart is desperately wicked, deceitful above all things. The greatest thing I need to know and remember about my heart is that apart from God's word, it's deceitful. It's wicked, it, and I will deceive my own self and not even realize it. And this is why we need the Word of God conveyed to our, to our spirit by the Spirit of God. But if you reject Scripture, if you reject Scripture, you leave yourself open to some very, very dangerous stuff. And that is, like number one, you, it, lean not. Watch this. Lean not into thine own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Now listen, this is a serious lesson to me. I'm happy. I'm, I'm glad to be here this morning, but it's a very serious thing because I watch people. I've looked at my own life. I've seen, I've experienced the consequences of messing with this, of rejecting what I knew the Bible clearly said, or trying to find something in the Bible that would justify my rejection of what I knew. One of the things that, uh, that uh, happens is, is that, well, God, I mean, and I think, forgive me for repeating myself, but when we reject Scripture as a guiding, and we, don't, and we say God show me or God lead me, but we reject it, one of the things that happens is silence. I said to you here, and, and this is what I was referring to a few seconds ago, a few s Sundays ago, I remember going down to my dad and asking him about a certain situation. He said, why are you asking me? You're not going to do what I ask you anyway. That's a sad shape to be in. And if my heavenly father, watch this, if my heavenly father says, why are you asking me? Because you only want me to go along with what you want to do. There would become a, there comes a silence. Whether I like it or you like it or anybody likes it, doesn't matter. When we have a resistant, rebellious spirit toward God. Our fellowship with God is not going to be what it could have been. And there's not going to be the back and forth and that communion and that fellowship that should have been there. Can't be. Uh, if your child becomes rebellious and just, you know, oh, yeah, they do watch you. But you tell there's that spirit of rebellion and, and there's just, you know, and you know, they, they call it a, a wall comes up. Uh, it's not like it used to be. I remember my mother, I was 13 years old, and my mom, had, of course, had no sisters and fourth in line, and I was doing a lot of dishes, and I hated doing dishes, and I hated housework. And I, I mean, it affected me, to be honest with you. I don't like it. And <laughs> just being truthful, I'm not, I'm not good to get up and go help dishes. I'll just tell you what, I was like, I did that the entire time I was growing up. It makes me sick. I was tickled. I buy my wife a dozen dishwashers. <laughs> I don't want to do dishes, but I, I do once in a while. But I'm just saying, if I was over here and having to do it, you know, here's one of the reasons why. It's no big deal, and I'm not whining. But everybody else going out to work. I'm a boy. I'm a young man. Everybody else going to haul hay. Everybody else going to cut wood. Everybody going to work cattle. I'm sitting there doing stupid dishes with my little dishwater hands in the house. I don't like that. I, you know, I'm just, <laughs> but I remember standing there. I, I was over here, and my mom was standing right here, and and all of a sudden, she just turned and looked at me and said, Reggie, I kind of, uh, yeah. She says, you're not the same boy that I had a year ago. You're not the same young man I had a year ago. Something's going on in your life. And what she was conveying to me was that her and I did not have the fellowship that we once had. And I just want to say to you that if you, won't, if you reject what Scripture says, expect, don't expect a great, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. But the opposite is true, too, that if we don't walk in the light, we can expect there not to be fellowship. Okay? All right. <clears throat> now, so the second thing is, is, now watch this very carefully. The second thing is by the Spirit of God. Okay? Now, God has never spoken to me audibly. 
Never has. Been a lot of times I sure wished he would have. <laughs> I wished I, he would have come out of the clouds and said, Reggie, start to do this, this, or this. But he hasn't. But let me just tell you this. That in the Bible, in the book of Acts chapter 8, the book of Acts chapter 10, the book of Acts chapter 13, the book of Acts chapter 16, the Spirit of God clearly spoke to the apostles about where they were to go and what they were to do. The Spirit said unto him, Y'all want to go see it? It's in there. Amen. It's in there. They literally told him, and, and, and they essayed to go one place. The Spirit said, uh uh, don't go there. So let me, a fact of it is, remember whenever uh, uh, Philip saw the Ethiopian eunuch? Well, the Spirit, the Spirit said, go join thyself to him. Uh, I believe this is very, very practical. Let me tell you why. You're out working or you're traveling doing something. And, and the Holy Spirit, there's a guy pumping gas over there, just like I was in the hospital the other day. There's a young man uh, hurt, uh, but he's cussing and going on. And uh, the Spirit of God prompted me to go pray with this man right there in the emergency waiting room area. And I didn't do it immediately. And when I didn't do it immediately, God brought him up, set him by me. So I started getting in gear. Now, you listen to me. I know as sure as I'm standing here this morning, the Spirit of God was prompting me to go talk to that boy. And I've many times in my life, I, I could tell you situations where men died three, four days after I was prompted to go talk to them. Sometimes I did and sometimes I didn't. But that'll get your attention. When, some, when you felt prompted to go to, talk to a lost person that you know about their soul and you don't and they died three days later, that perk, you know, if that don't perk your ears up, I don't know what does. Yeah. Now, back in the Old Testament, Elijah had went through the Mount Carmel situation, was going through this depression time. He was living, he went to the cave and um, God came to him. And uh, God said, what doest thou here, Elijah? God talked to him. Now, in the Old Testament, there were many, many times when God spoke to people. I mean, literally spoke to people. But what I do like about this passage of Scripture is that there was a fire and earthquake and all that stuff. And then the Bible said there was this, a still small voice. Amen. Still small voice. Did you know you have to be quiet to hear a still small voice? Everything can't be rattling. You can't be all, everything, your whole world like this. And that's why I come apart and rest a while. And, you know... Everybody in here, you've got decisions to make, important decisions. Well, I tell you what, we've got, we've got the beating and the bruise and the bang to coming in here right and left. There's Jackson back there. How you doing, Jax? Pretty good. We're praying for you. Justin, at least you're at church, man. You don't, you don't look like a, a foreign terrorist now so bad. Boy, he had that black <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. He started laughing and, got, and then pain came across. So anyway, we've all, we're all here this morning, but we're glad to see you all here. So anyway, I'll tell you what, I mean that. Uh, I think we better get us some prayer groups and prayer coverings going on in this church house and, and get, you know, one man praying for 10 families, another man praying for 10 families and praying for them every day, keeping everybody safe in this place. But anyway, um, uh, let me just say again, now, now, here's a big thing that you need to get a hold of. Neither the Scripture and the Spirit are going to work together. Okay? The Spirit of God is never, and I would write this down, never leads you to violate the written will of God. Somebody says, well, I believe the Holy Spirit led me to do this. If it's in violation of Scripture, he did not. Take your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. And, um, boy, I'll tell you what, I'm having a hard time getting there. My goodness, it's good to be at church this morning. I'll tell you what. I so appreciate all of you. 1 John chapter 4, if I can ever get there. Okay, verse number one says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. Now, how would you do that? By the word. 
Does this match the word of God? Does this match the character of God? Does this match the nature of God? Is this consistent with uh, the God of the Bible? Is this consistent with the spirit of God? And uh, I don't know why I keep saying this, but to me, this is probably one of the most important Bible class lessons you could ever have in a church. Because people are living every day with wrong decisions. Wrong decisions. And, and, uh, and, and, and it's so sad. Anyway, it'll never be in uh, violation of the Spirit. Now, let me just say something further about the Spirit of God. Uh, if a person is living a general life in opposition to being led by, walking in, being filled with the Spirit, you're just resistant to that in a general sense in your life. I do not believe you can expect the Spirit of God to do much communication with you. And here's why. That grieves the Holy Spirit. That grieves the Holy Spirit. So part of the way that, that to know that you're being led of the Spirit is, again, it'll never lead you into violation of the Word of God. But I'm a firm believer, this is for me personally, that you're not going to get much leading from the Spirit without having been a lot in the Scripture. I just don't believe that you're going to, if you're just donking around watching TV and everything else and your Bible hardly is ever read, and then all of a sudden you think the Spirit of God is leading you to go do this, I don't put much stock in it. Okay? All right. Um, here's a big way and a major way that God speaks to all of us. And most people don't, don't want it and reject it. Through God-ordained authority. Through God-ordained authority. <clears throat> As I look back now in my life, I can see where uh, your children, did you know they're going to be led mostly by their God-ordained authority of the parents? How many would agree to that? You'd at least know that, that my children, I'm, if, I, if I'm a parent and God ordained authority over them, that's how God's mostly going to be leading your children is through your direction. Okay? So, and one of the things God wants you to teach them through that is, is that in obeying your, their human authorities, it teaches them to obey the divine authority, the word of God, and our Heavenly Father. And so get direct, you get direction through that. Um, just going back to my own experiences in life, my dad, my dad was never taught this, although he, I think he understood it to a great degree. Uh, most people who've been in the military understand <laughs> authority a little better than, than a lot of people. But as far as biblically being taught that I never heard it discussed in my church while I was growing up the entire time in my life. I never heard my mom and dad talk about it. You know, I think they had a concept of authority and all that. But they did not understand that uh, or, or comprehend to a degree the Bible teaches about this. And the reason I say that is because if we, if we just kind of let the kids say, well, whatever you want to do or those under our authority, uh, just whatever you want to do, uh, there's a, there, there becomes an attitude of disregard for authority and decision making of life. And that's dangerous. Um, many young people right now, that's their whole, their whole problem is life, is that they're out from underneath authority, don't understand authority. That's why military has been good for a lot of people, because first time in their life, somebody made them shut up and stand straight and listen. Amen. And they've never been, never been made to do that in their entire life. But God is going to speak through God-ordained authority. I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. This is the most unbelieved verse I know of in the Bible right now. Nobody believes this verse in real, in real life situation. Hebrews chapter 13. Would some man stand and read verse 17? Verse 17, please. Some man stand and read verse 17. Thank you, brother. Go right ahead. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls as they that must give account. But they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. All right. Now, it doesn't explicitly here talk about 
uh, those that have the rule over you, although the general situation from the context is your spiritual leaders, okay? Now, in fact, when it says they watch for your souls, well, watch this. A parent, would not a parent be watching for your soul? Hopefully. You'd hope a parent would be watching for your soul. But the immediate context here is, is church authority. And I'm going to tell you something. Danny, I, don't, I, don't, I would like your take on this. I'd like any minister's take on this. The average person in American churches do not believe that the pastor has any authority in their life. Pastor said, what, what if I was to say today this? <laughs> Watch this. I want you all to get your TVs out of your house. I'm your pastor. I love you. And I'm commanding that every family that belongs to this church... Get your TVs out of your house. It's killing you. They won't do it. This is what, let me tell you, this right here is why the church has lost all influence in America. Did you know, did you know why the liberals and progressives are just yip, yip, yipping? Here's why. In their self-righteous, out-of-hell, self-righteous eyes and perspective, they look back at America, and they have framed America out to be a horrible colonist who came in and stole all the lands from the Indians, enslaved all the blacks, and uh, enriched themselves. And um, now, and then they... then. In, in Canada right now, they've burned 10 to 12 churches in Canada in the last two weeks. These people have. And there's a reason. It's because they, they believe that your church has failed their nation. And the liberals believe with all of their hearts. Now listen to me, I know what I'm talking about. That the church, Christian people, have failed America. Okay? And that because the church has failed America, they must take the mantle of righteousness in their righteous crusade to rectify all the evils and the wrongs of America. And that the church must be done away with and Christianity must be done away with because it has uh, been nothing but a vehicle for white supremacy and uh, colonization and theft and ruination of other oppressed people's lives. That's exactly what they think. And that's why they want your kids. And they're not playing games. It's satanic. They won't talk about all that the church has done for America. There's never been a nation on the face of the earth kinder and gooder and more blessed than America. Never been a nation on the face of this earth that gave more money and more food and more housing and more help and sent more medicine to anybody in the world. To even the people that hated us. The people we had to defeat with the blood of our sons. They don't talk about all the hospitals. How many has ever been to an atheist hospital? There are none. But you see, they, they're, they're the ones. See, he who frames the, the, the conversation wins the debate. And they are framing the conversation. And so the, the debate isn't even heard on the other side. It's only what they want people to hear. That's why they've taken control of the media, the educational system, and now they're, the, the bill that's up here about the voting deal is to totally take over America politically. If that bill is passed, you say goodbye to this country. Because the Democrat Party will have taken absolute control of all the vo voting. will no longer be controlled by states. It will be controlled by the federal government. And, and they will absolutely control everything. They'll make sure their, their people win every time. Yes. But the reason is, like you said, table of the wilderness. Um, it stopped when they let them stop in the churches. The biblical foundation of the shepherd. Yep. People stop listening to the shepherd, which the pastor is, to lead the sheep. And they stop listening to God and Jesus. They took it out of everything. Exactly. So they left free reign for the enemy to do whatever he wanted to do. So here's what's happened. Getting back to this thing. The here's what the deal is. The church has no authority to its own people. That's right. 
I mean to tell you, people are walking in church this morning across America, walk right straight out, and they're going to live just like they wanted to live when they walked in. And woe be to the preacher that says differently. We'll make his life miserable. That's why 95% of your preachers are under bondage in their pulpits. They cannot preach. They'll tell, they tell me, don't talk to me about it. They call me, they tell me. I would give my eye teeth to be as free as you are, Reggie, to be able to say the things that you say. But if I did, I'm out. There's more people than you know knows the truth. But they, I've got a car payment, Reggie. I've got a house payment, Reggie. How am I going to pay them? How am I going to pay my bills if I get thrown out? Now, they'll throw me out the dominant. They'll make sure I don't get another church. I'm 48 years old. What am I going to do? So I'm talking this morning this, but through God-ordained authority. There's not a person in this church, as I hope and pray, that does not believe that children ought to obey their mom and dad in the Lord. Amen. And if you tell them to take the garbage out, they ought to take the garbage out. And they ought to not have to fight them over it 16 times. Amen. But when it comes to God's word and the church, I'll do what I want to when I want to. Right. And I grew up that way. Danny, I grew up just, well, it's kind of like a smorgasbord. I can take or leave it. And I left most of it. Another way that God may speak to you is this. This is God's choice way to speak to me. <laughs> Chastisement, affliction. Psalmist David said, it is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. You know what he's saying? I never did learn nothing from the Bible till God whooped me. Amen. I heard it and I heard it and I heard it, but it didn't have any effect on my life. And when God whooped me and chastised me, all of a sudden, oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, that was there. Chastisement, afflicted. Loss. That, and by the way, that can, can be included in chastisement. I mean, it's kind of like the old boy said, what else is God going to have to do to you to get your attention? <laughs> but God, watch this, watch this. He that being often reproved, and God's reproved him over and over again, and hardeneth his neck, Shall it be suddenly cut off on that without remedy? That's a wild verse, buddy. And it happens all the time. Okay, let's try one more or two more. And then we're going to get into this text. Signs and wonders and dreams. Job's buddies had some dreams. Chills come up back of his neck. Hair stood up on his head. <laughs> now listen, the Bible has lots of dreams in it. And the dream, a lot of those dreams were, were from God. The Bible's got lots of signs. All that. God did signs and wonders down in Egypt. But you and I are not in the signs and wonders days. Let me tell you what you How many knows what the Bible said you'd live by? Faith. Faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing comes by the word of God. I had a wild dream the other night. Crazy. How many had a wild dream the last week or two? <laughs> Aren't dreams stupid? How many ever thought, where in the world would that have come from? I mean, how on earth did I ever think of such a stupid? How would that go through my mind? I'm going to tell you about me. You do what you want to. I don't trust my dreams. I do not use dreams to determine what I'm going to do to obey God, nothing of that nature, okay? I don't, I don't, I don't trust visions. I actually don't trust much what anybody says. Okay? You know, I'm, I'm just talking out here in some general situation. Um, I'm, not, I'm not talking here about a vision of life that God gives you, okay? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you had a dream and and I, ha I mean, I've had people say, Reggie, I was, I was outside the other night and, and Jesus stepped out on the cloud and he said this and this. I don't believe that. I'm sorry. Don't want to make you mad. I don't believe it. If he did, I missed the second coming. <laughs> you know. And, I, and here's the thing about it. I, I don't necessarily believe that God would never do that. But if I do it, I leave myself open to, okay, the next time 
something happens, you know, and I just don't want to mess with it. To me, I've entered into a, a, a spiritual realm that I have no business messing with, and I can get fooled with real, real easy. And um, somebody says, well, Reggie, my aunt so-and-so said that I was supposed to go to mission field. Well, why didn't God tell you it had been just as easy? <laughs> you know, and let me give you a little hint. There are people out here who are so sorry and low down that have gotten so rotten inside that they think they want to become super spiritual and tell everybody else what God wants them to do. That's stupidity out of hell. Amen. I want to tell you something. No, God didn't need somebody else to tell me to call, call to preach. That's right. So don't get super spiritual and try to prove your spirituality by going around telling everybody else what God told you they're supposed to do. That's nonsense out of hell. Amen. It aggravates me because it messes people up and gets them confused and everything else. Okay, one, one other thing before we uh, go out of that is, um, uh, and, and I'll throw this out here, and I'll just write it up where you can see it. Circumstances. You're working at the hospital, watch this. You're working at the hospital. You've been working there 14 years. You love your work. You train for it. You like it. The hospital says you're going to have to take a COVID vaccine shot to remain employed here. You have a decision to make. A lot of times circumstances can uh, give direction. I, I don't think it should be the only thing you use, but I think it can be. If, For instance, if one door shuts, it may be that God is shutting that door to get you up because you know how we are? We won't ever leave Egypt unless God gets us out of there, you know? And sometimes God has to mess the nest up to get the baby eaglet to fly. So sometimes God creates circumstances that, that directs you. Be very, very careful about this. And the reason I say that is because if you're not careful, you'll move when you should have stayed. I'm not sure. Now if, I, if I say this again tonight, don't, don't get shook at me because my mind whirls all the time. Does anybody know how a wolf keeps himself from being eaten by wolves, how a moose keeps himself from being eaten by wolves. He doesn't move. He can have eight wolves around him and that moose will back up to a tree, he'll back up to some type of protective, maybe it's a rock, He'll back up to it. And as long as he doesn't run, he'll make it. But the second his fear drives him to run, he's a dead moose. That's why you want to be careful about letting things that would produce fear in you drive you. God has so ordained that that moose, if he will stand, he'll be all right. And by the way, did you know people who study these things say it doesn't take those wolves but just a few minutes to discern whether this moose is scared or whether he's going to stand. And in just a few minutes, if he doesn't spook, they'll go chase somebody else because they know they'll never get him. Most of the time, you and I just need to stand. Not let circumstances drive us. Okay, we're going to make some decisions here real quick and then go to Numbers chapter 22. Let's ask some questions here. I have a decision to make. Should I divorce my wife? <laughs> my husband. <laughs> some of you kids. God, should I run away from home? <laughs> you have decisions to make. Uh, should I take this job? Should I tell my spouse... Uh, should I get this out of my life? I, I'm going to say something. They were on live. And I want to welcome everybody online. You're a real encouragement to us. There's a guy in Florida I want to say hi to. His name is Redneck on Facebook. Redneck, hello. I want to tell you I appreciated a couple of your posts this week. You're probably one of the most honest guys I've ever listened to in my life. He's rough. But he's honest. And I like those kind of people. Uh, there's all kinds of things. 
should I wear this apparel? Should I make, you know, make it appear this certain way? Should I buy that kind of garment? Should I buy that kind of rig? It's all kinds of decisions to make. So we're going to go to what I feel like is probably the one of the most powerful biblical things about, how to, about making decisions in, in the Bible. And about um, decisions making. Numbers chapter 2, is everybody there say amen? All righty. Um, let's take off in verse, let's just take off in verse number 9 this morning. Verse number 9. And we're going to pick up from there the story. And I tell you what, <laughs> there's no way we're going to get to the bottom of this one. It would have been good if you had some uh, uh, understanding about this man, Balaam. He's one of the most interesting studies in the Bible. He's one of the most terrible people in the Bible. He's mentioned in the book of Revelation. He's mentioned uh, uh, in the book of uh, Jude. Is it Jude? Yeah. And maybe another place. Okay. Now what we've got here, and God came to verse number 9. Now here's what happened. The children of Israel were coming up out of the land of Egypt... And the king Balak saw these people coming, and he wanted to hire a preacher. And he said, he saw Balaam, and he, Balaam was a prophet, and Balaam had a lot of powers in that area of the country. He wanted to hire him. He said, I'll hire you to curse Israel. Okay? I want to hire you to curse Israel. So verse number 9 picks it up there. And God came unto Balaam and said, What men are these with thee? And Balaam said unto God, Balak the son of Zippor, king of Moab, that's the descendants of Lot, hath sent unto me, saying, Behold, there is a people come out of Egypt, which covereth the face of the earth. Come now, curse them me, me them. Peradventure I shall be able to overcome them and drive them out. Now I want everybody to honk in on verse number 12. And God said to Balaam, God said to Balaam, <laughs> He spoke to him. This is God's word to him. Thou shalt not go with them. Pretty plain? Is that plain enough for everybody? Amen. Okay. Thou shalt not curse the people for they are blessed. Pretty plain. And Balak rose up in the morning and said unto the princes of Balak, Get you to your land for the Lord refuses to give me leave to go with you. Well, sounds like he's obedient, doesn't it? Boy, this is, I, have, I do not know of a passage of Scripture in the Bible that reveals the heart of men like this passage here does. Verse 14, the prince of Moab rose up, went to Balak, and said, Balak, Balaam refuses to come with us. Now watch this. And Balak sent yet again princes. This is, he's a picture of the devil here. Balak didn't give up. He sent yet again princes more and more honorable than they. He's, now, Write down here Ephesians six twelve. For we wrestle not against princi uh, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Okay. So Balak says, "I send a prince over to talk to him, so I'm going to send more princes." This is pressing. Verse sixteen. They came to Balaam and said to him, "Thus saith Balak the son of Zippor, Let nothing, I pray thee, hinder thee from coming unto me." Now, what's he telling him? What's he telling Balaam? Don't listen to God. Don't listen to God. Don't let anything cheat you out of this good deal. Don't let, you, don't let anything keep you from getting this job, from making this money. Watch what, verse 14. Here's the bribe. For I will promote thee unto very great honor, and I will do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. Come therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people. Hmm. And Balaam answered and said unto the servants of Balak, <laughs> well, watch this now. If Balaam, Balak would give me the, his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord, my God, to do less or more. Boy, I mean, it just sounds like this guy's really taking a stand. Man, alive. He's, this guy's really standing up. You know what? Let me tell you something. <clears throat> Most people aren't standing near as much as they tell you they are. Most of us smoke in mirrors. And I'm going to show you, watch verse 19, he's going to tell you what the deal is. Now therefore I pray you, tarry ye here also this night that I may know what the Lord will say unto me more. Anybody know what's wrong there? <laughs> what's wrong, Caleb? He's wanting God to say some other stuff. God's already told him what to do. But he wants God to change his mind. 
What more can he say than to you he has said? That's just like us. We already know what the Bible says. But surely there's a way around it. Surely, surely there's a way. Oh, watch this. I said a while ago, when you reject the word of God, you will open yourself up to voices that will pretend they're from God. And you'll think, I'm in the will of God. And one of the things that will confirm it to you is it's what you wanted to do already. This is working out good. So he said, you guys just get your hotel room over there and I'll talk to God tonight and see what more he says. Now this is wild. You get hold of this. God came unto Balaam at night and said unto him, if the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. But yet the word which I shall say unto thee, that shall thou do. How many knows that if you tinker with God, he'll let you have... How many know that he told the children of Israel, I gave them their request, but sent leanness to their souls? How many knows that it's the nature of God for rebellious children, or rebellious people, to, if you have it in your heart, to do it your way anyway, he will eventually let you do it. Now, he conditioned but all he's going to do is he's giving. These things are written for our learning that we, you know, we could learn from this, what the New Testament says. <clears throat> and so verse 21, and Balaam rose up in the morning, sat on his ass, and went with the princes to Moab. Look at verse 22. And God's anger was kindled because he went. Can I give you something? There is God's perfect will for your life. And then there's God's permissive will for your life. And if you constantly live just in his permissive will, you're going to have a miserable life. Yeah. Miserable. God wants you and I to live in his perfect will. And his perfect will is in his perfect word. And he just wants us to simply obey what he said. He's already got your best in mind. He already has my best in mind. Nobody loves me like he loves me. Nobody cares for me like he cares for me. And he just wants me to do what he said. Well, God's anger was kindled because he went, the angel of the Lord. Now watch this. Watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. The angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. What's he got going now? He's got God against him. But here's the sad part. He, he can't even see it. Angel stood in the way of adversary against him. Now he was riding upon his ass, and two servants were with him. And the ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand. And the ass turned aside out of the way and went into the field. Watch this. Here comes Balaam. Got his two servants back here behind him. He's on his ass. He's on his donkey. They're riding along. Donkey looks up. You see, the angel of the Lord with his sworn drawn. Now, this is not monkey business. That's, 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 it's an adversary and God going to kill you. Okay? What's the donkey do? He turns and goes out beside the field. And what the scene, you need to visualize this. Balaam's going, I, get, he's pulling on the reins. Pulling on the reins. He's starting to get aggravated. What's this donkey? Get, uh. Donkey, this. So let's see, what, let's see what Balaam does. He does exactly what we do. And Balaam, look at the last part of that verse. And Balaam smote the ass to turn her into the way. He got mad. Because he cannot, you know why he got mad? Because he cannot see that God is trying to give him directions. That God is trying to stop him from destroying himself. Verse 24, but the angel of the Lord stood in the path of the vineyards. So here, here's what happens. I wish I had a stick. He's got this stick and he beats, he beats this, this ass back into the pathway where he's wanting to go. All right? So he's got the ass straightened back up. Now he's coming into some vineyards. And the Bible said the wall on this side, the wall on this side. And the ass is going down through here. All right? This is what God will do with you and I. I've had it happen to me. 
God's first time was out in the field, not too tight. Don't pay attention to that. Start beat, trying to beat things around in our life. Going to beat our way around everything. All of a sudden, God will pull you into a tighter situation. Here it comes. Verse 24, but the angel of the Lord stood in the path of the vineyards, a wall being on this side and a wall on that side. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself against the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. The ass is going, I mean, what's, does anybody know what the ass is not wanting to happen? Didn't want to die. Balaam's on it. By the way, can I say a little secret? It's not the ass that the angel's after. It's the man riding him. And right now the ass is trying to save his life. And so he smote her again. So here's what's happening. The more Balaam fought against God, the more he fought against the will of God in his life, the more he fought against what God said to do or not to do, he smote her again. The pressure comes, the pain comes, the anger, the irritation, the physical retaliation. Life has become absolutely unbearable, miserable. Verse 26, and the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. All right, God's got him now cornered. You ain't going no way. You ain't going one way. You ain't going the other. You're going to face this thing. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam. Now watch this. And Balaam's anger was kindled, and he smote the ass with a staff. I want you to get the scene. This donkey has been carrying Balaam. Took him out in the field, tried to get him away from keeping being killed by the Lord. He beats him back into the path. Takes him down through a vineyard, a narrow a place there, the walls on each side. The angel of the Lord's there, going to kill him. The, the, in trying to stop him, he runs over against the wall, crushes Balaam's foot. And he beats him again. And now they're going into a narrow place. Watch this. They're going into a narrow place. And the ass sees the angel of the Lord with the sworn drawn. And the ass, watch this, fell down. And what does he do? He starts beating this donkey that's down on the ground. Beat me. Beat me. And I want to tell you something this morning. That's what we do to people around us who have to live with us and put up with us when we're out of the will of God and we're determined to go our own way and disobey the Bible. If it wasn't so sad, this would be the funny part. Verse 28. And the Lord opened the mouth of the ass and said unto Balaam, What have I done unto thee, that thou hast smitten me these three times? Now, I've always said this. It isn't the ass speaking to Balaam that really gets me. It's Balaam speaking to the ass. <laughs> How many of you ever had a talk with your horse? <laughs> This is how crazy this kind of stuff gets. I'm serious with you. And the ass, verse 28, And the Lord opened the mouth of the ass and said unto Balaam, What have I done unto thee that thou hast smitten me these three times? Balaam said unto the ass, Because thou hast mocked me, I would there were a sword in my hand, for now I would kill thee. Here's the very, what's the, the very means by which God was trying to keep him from being killed. He wants to kill that's how hard-hearted, how mean and vicious we get when we say, God, I will not go your way. And so, <clears throat> verse 30, And the ass said unto Balaam, And I not thine ass, upon which thou hast ridden ever since I was thine unto this day. Was I ever want to do so unto thee? And Balaam, he answered, Nay. And here's what you better pray hope happens. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam. And 
and he saw. I wonder today what it's going to take to open your eyes. Jail, prison, loss of health, loss of this, a divorce, a dead family member. What's it going to take to open our eyes? The tried truth of it is, is that we never see anything till God opens our eyes. We just don't see it. It's about quitting time. <clears throat> the Lord opened, verse 31, the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand. And he bowed down his head and fell flat on his face. This is Balaam. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Why, Wherefore hast thou smitten thine ass these three times? Behold, I went out to withstand thee, because thy way is perverse before me and the ass saw me and turned from me these three times unless she had turned from me surely now I had slain thee and saved her alive you ain't never anything like this you know, I mean folks you, you ain't going to get this I could take you into Harvard University and outside any Bible that might be on their shelves they do not have this wisdom in there and you will not get it I don't care if you go there 14 years I could take you to any university in this country. I could take you to any school and most churches in this country, and they will not tell you this truth. And we wonder why things are happening, and God's trying to speak to us. And he wants you to read his word and say, You know, Lord, open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things that I little on. Lord, give me a heart and open my eyes that I can see it. Give me a heart that wants to obey the word. Verse 34, And Balaam said unto the angel, Lord, I have sinned, for I knew not that thou stoodest in the way against me. Thou, therefore, I, if it displease thee, I will get me back again. I'm not in the monkey business. All of my life, I've watched Satan destroy people. And when I read and think about these things, I, I get angry at myself more than anybody else because I've been so slow to listen to God. I pray this morning the Sunday school lesson will help us to say, Lord, you're not going to have to send an angel with a sword and you're not going to have to beat and I'm not going to make life miserable for everything around me. <clears throat> I hope. Anybody got any thoughts or comments this morning? Awful quiet in here. <laughs> this is heavy water, right? Amen. This is heavy water, but it's good water. This is wisdom. This is wisdom. This is wisdom. This is understanding. Yes, brother. I'm not saying this to bar you up or anything, but I've heard this passage preached on, I don't know how many times, different portions of it. And that's the first time I've ever heard it brought out like that. And it just, it just amazed me. Um, Lord spoke about that passage this morning like I've never heard it before. Thank you, Lord. It's, a, it's so real. And it's so, so, so real to life. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot more to the life of Balaam, and most people will focus on that in the sense of, uh, and I understand what you're saying. Um, I'll be honest with you. It, it, it's probably 20 years ago God showed that to me one day when I was studying. And uh, I preached it a few times, revival, preached it here, revival means. But it's a truth that is so powerful, that is so neglected. And I'm just going to be honest with you. Why, well, it means so much to me because I'm guilty of the same thing. Just saying, God, I'm going to do it my way and I'm going to figure out a way where I can say at the end, you, it was you, you went along with this. <coughs> I 
hope it helps us. I really do. Let me give you one thing. We'll stand. I think they're about done down there. Many years ago, <clears throat> I, in, I'm just trying to give you this and say, hope it might help you. <clears throat> Several years ago, uh, one day I was just thinking and, you know, trying to talk to the Lord and just visiting with the Lord, trying to listen, read my Bible, trying to listen to the Lord, be, have my ear cut to God. And it came to me that we ought to have a 4th of July celebration out here, faith, uh, f- family, and freedom celebration. And, boy, you know, I got to think about this, that, and the other, and, and present it to the church, and, and we did it, didn't we? And it was very, very successful. How many would say it was super successful? And it just got bigger every year. Until the last year, I think there was 3,000 people here out there on that ball diamond. And God blessed it, and he always provided for it, everything. I mean, just every, I never seen anything like it. Just everything we needed, God would just bring it. And, and Lakeys would bring their hay deal over, and you'd have this big mountain of hay. And it was just amazing what God brought together just right here in this church. We did that seven years, and then this, after the seventh year during the winter, it's like one day just something went, Dean, and yes, Lord, don't do that no more. That's all I want. Well, Lord, them, them's really going good, and we're having huge crowds, and people really appreciate that, and we're trying to glorify your name, and, and that's fine, but I don't want you doing it no more. Done. Well, I'd been down the road long enough, Brother Matt, but that time I kind of like, okay. So I announced that. Did you know there were people in the church got mad at me over that? Made statements down the road and all this kind of stuff. And you know, I said, well, let me ask you this here. You seem to think it was fine that I was listening to God at the start. But when he told me to stop, <laughs> I wasn't listening to God, Danny, anymore. See? Yeah, yeah. See, I, I, so I'm just saying this to you. Whenever we, we've got a building project going on down here. How do you, how do you know whether you start to do that or not? I just try to listen to God. And I don't always maybe get it right, but I try. Let's stand. We better. Oh, wait a minute. I need three people that will take my place singing this morning. Three men. Have I got three men? There's Danny. Don's in. I need one more man that'll take my place. Some of you right over there. Thank you. Thank you. I'll tell you what. Let's stand together and have a, a prayer and be dismissed. And I love you. I'll tell you what. I'm glad you're here. How you doing, sister? When you get married? Next November. The 6th of November. 12th November next year. 2022. 2022. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Well, the Lord may come before that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. All righty. It's so good to have everybody out today, and I pray. I hope that you'll get some out of this. I hope you'll put some thought into this. Hope you'll be where you don't have to beat on the mule. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Brother Paul Wade, how you feeling, buddy? I'm okay. Boy, I tell you what, that sounds good. Would you dismiss us, and then let's all come and sing to our Lord today. Amen. Our Father, we thank you today for this. Valuable lesson that uh, we have learned, learned, and heard in this class this morning. We just pray that we'll take it and, and, and learn from it and apply it to each of our lives individually. Thank you for the messenger that brought it. We pray uh, for good health for him. Pray for you did Brother Reg this week. Pray that you uh, just be with him and be with the doctors. And say, uh, uh, do what they need to do. Thank you now for this uh, time that we're going into of worship. We pray that uh, we'd uh, 